are two aspects of the procedure of argumentation to which speculative thinking is opposed and which call for further notice. First, such thinking adopts a negative attitude towards the content it apprehends. It knows how to refute it and destroy it. That something is not the case is, merely, is a merely negative insight, a dead end which does not lead to new content beyond itself. In order to have a content once again, something new must be taken over from elsewhere. Argumentation is reflection into the empty eye, the vanity of its own, its own knowing. This vanity, however, expresses not only the vanity of this content, but also the futility of this insight itself. For this insight is the negative that fails to see the positive within itself. Because this reflection does not get its very negativity as its content, it is never at the heart of the matter, but always beyond it. For this reason, it imagines that by establishing the void, it is always ahead of any insight rich in content. On the other hand, in speculative thinking, as we've already shown, the negative belongs to the content itself and is the positive. Both as the imminent movement and determination of the content and as the whole of this process. Looked at as a result, what emerges from this process is the determinate negative, which is consequently a positive content as well. Section 59 begins by telling us that there are two aspects of the procedure of argumentation, or raisonieren, which speculative, we've got that up there, but grief into thinking, is opposed to and which call for further notice. But then Hegel goes and tells us not just about two, but about a, a number of different aspects of this. So I, I don't actually think it's that helpful to try, as you're reading this, this passage, to figure out exactly what the second aspect is, because there, there's more than one candidate for that. He starts out saying, first, such reasoning adopts a negative attitude towards the content it apprehends. And I've got that represented here. Um, Argumentation, raisonieren, is being carried out. What does he mean by, by, by this, this term? This is a good point to pause for just a moment. And notice that, that um, what we've got here, lexically, is actually sort of a, a German loan word coming in from French. And, you know, I don't want to say in every single case, but in many cases when you've got a a French or Latinate loanword coming in, and it's being contrasted to something that's, you know, plain old German like begriff. Um, the German one is going to be the positive one, the, the one that we want, and, and the other one is going to be, there's going to be something wrong with it. And what Hegel has in mind by, by this is the kind of skeptical or constantly questioning, constantly undermining philosophy of the French Enlightenment, also the British Enlightenment, but not the, the further German Enlightenment. This position, this position of, of uh, argumentation, of reasoning, of enlightenment, is always able to point out something wrong, something missing, something negative, something lacking, in the content. So like he says, it takes a negative attitude towards the experience, towards the subject matter that's being studied. He says, it knows how to refute it and destroy it. And I think that, you know, we can find plenty of philosophical attitudes in our own time that adopt a similar sort of perspective. If we begin from the, unless you prove it to me by some sort of, you know, appeal to philosophical intuitions, or, you know, uh, what, what somebody said in this article over here that just you know, was written 20 years ago and, and we're taking as being the as hallmark for what counts as philosophy, which often happens in analytic philosophy, uh, we're going to reject it. If we can raise any defeaters, if we can raise any counterexamples, if we can come up with any ways to parse what you said so that it could be said a little bit differently and there, thereby wrong, then we're going to take a negative attitude towards it and say, well, it's, it's, it could be that it's actually some, some good, but we can't see it at this point. So we have this kind of skeptical attitude available 
in philosophy, in, in not just in philosophy, but, but all across the board in various uh, disciplines and institutions, not just in Hegel's time, but in our own time. So he's pointing something out to us. He says, it takes a, a negative attitude towards the content that it apprehends. It knows how to refute it, how to destroy it. That something is not the case is, is a merely negative insight, though. To, to tell us if, if that's going to be what philosophy really is. And this is one reason why a lot of people get turned off on philosophy, isn't it? Because they go into a philosophy class, and they, you know, at least they think they know something when they go in, and the instructor, you know, leads them through some things, and we find out we don't really know what free will is, we don't really know what, you know, whether we're free or not, we don't even know what determinism is, you know, we can pick whatever examples, we don't know what the good is, and people come out of that, and, and, and they're like, well, crap, now what am I going to do with this? And very quickly, they, they come to the conclusion that, well, philosophy is a fun game that you play while the semester goes on or, you know, when you've got nothing better to do. But when we actually get out into the real world where we, we do have to make commitments and we do need to think in terms of content that we're not just going to reject, um, then I guess philosophy is no, no use to us. And, and this is a, a position that, that many people arrive at because they only encounter this kind of thinking. So he says, um, argumentation is reflection into the empty eye, that is the, the reasoning subject. Um, I probably should have put that here. What we're talking about is the subject who's actually carrying this out, the subject who is adopting this critical stance towards everything. And if they want something positive, like he points out, they, they've got to bring it in from the outside. What does this lead to? A, a merely negative insight. Or, as he says, vanity. He says, um, the vanity, however, is the vanity is the vanity of its own knowing, because it doesn't actually know anything. It, uh, all it does is knows that things are not the case. But it, it expresses not only the vanity of this content, it turns the content into kind of a nothing. It is never at the heart of the matter, but always beyond it, which shows us that what we're talking about here is a vanity or a futility. Not vanity in the sense of pride, but vanity in the sense of, like in Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanity, all is vanities. Everything is worthless. Everything is empty. Everything is futile. And that's all this position can ultimately, on its own, provide. When it works, it works because there's something else going on in addition to it. If you were going to think about it in recipe terms, it would be as if all you had was baking powder. Can't do much with that now, can you? Add it to some other things and you can make some interesting things happen. This is not without some value, but by itself, taken as the model for philosophy, it's not, it's not adequate. So he says um, it, it ends up being ahead of the matter. It's always able to say, yeah, I can see that this is not going to, to really work out. This is not going to be what we need. And it's, it's setting itself up in this kind of uh, stance for not apprehending the content. So he says, speculative, or begreifende thinking, uh, that which uses the begriff, the concept, the notion, is proceeding in a very different way. He says, the negative belongs to the content itself. Instead of it bringing negation to the content, what it does is it approaches the content, it allows the content to actually unfold itself, show its own form, and as it turns out, as we've seen, you know, over and over and over again, it contains negativity, it's self-others, part of self-movement is this self-othering process, we don't need to go into all that. But what he wants to get at here is by doing that, it eventually produces a new positive content. This is actually what Hegel is going to call determinate negation, which means producing something that's other, something that's new, something that's actually positive. Negation is not purely nullifying or destroying. Negation takes place by way of producing something new, something that's opposed. So he says that looked at as, as a result, 
what emerges from this process is the determinate negative, which is consequently a positive content as well. You might say, well, how can a negative be a positive? It depends on the relationality, how you're looking at it. In terms of the, the, the content that you began with, it's a negation of it, and in terms of the content that you began with, it's also something other, something additional, and in that, it is something positive. And as something positive, it can become its own content, and then it can be a negation of, of that. And this is the way that the dialectic proceeds. This attitude towards it can't grasp the dialectic as any sort of progress, and it winds up being stuck in vanity or futility. But in view of the fact that such thinking has a content, whether of picture thoughts or abstract thoughts or a mixture of both, argumentation has another side which makes comprehension difficult for it. The remarkable nature of this other side is closely linked with the above-mentioned essence of the idea, or rather it expresses the idea in the way that it appears as the movement, which is thinking apprehension. For whereas in its negative behavior, which we've just discussed, ratiocinative thinking is itself the self which the content to which the content returns, in its positive cognition, on the other hand, the self is a subject to which the content is related as accident and predicate. This subject constitutes the basis to which their content is attached, and upon which the movement runs back and forth. Speculative thinking behaves in a different way. Since the notion is the object's own self, which presents itself as the coming to be of the object, it is not a passive subject inertly supporting the accidents. It is, on the contrary, the self-moving notion which takes its determinations back into itself. In this movement, the passive subject itself perishes. It enters into the differences and the content and constitutes the determinateness that is the differentiated content and its movement instead of remaining inertly over against it. The solid ground which argumentation has in the passive subject is therefore shaken and only this movement itself becomes the object. The subject that fills the content ceases to go beyond it. It cannot can have any further predicates or accidental properties. Conversely, the dispersion of the content is thereby bound together under the self. It is not the universal which, free from the subject, could belong to several others. Thus the content is, in fact, no longer a predicate of the, the subject, but is the substance, the essence, and the notion of what is under discussion. Picture thinking, whose nature it is to run through the accidents and predicates, and which, because they're nothing more than accidents and predicates, rightly goes beyond them, is checked in its progress. Since that which has the form of a predicate and a proposition is the substance itself, it suffers, as we might put it, a counter-thrust. Starting from the subject as though this were a permanent ground, it finds that since the predicate is really the substance, the subject has passed over into the predicate, and by this very fact has been sublated. And since in this way what seems to be the predicate has become the whole and the independent mass, thinking cannot roam at will, but is impeded by this weight. Usually, the subject is first made the basis as the objective fixed self. Thence the necessary movement to the multiplicity of determinations or predicate proceeds. Here, that subject is replaced by the knowing I itself, which links the predicates with the subject holding them. But since that first subject enters into the determinations themselves and is their soul, the second subject, that is the knowing I, still finds in the predicate what it thought it had finished with and got away from, and from which it had hoped to return into itself. And instead of being able to function as the determining agent in the movement of predication, arguing back and forth whether to attach this or that predicate, it is really still occupied with the self of the content, having to remain associated with it instead of being for itself. Section 60, which is quite long, also has a lot of things going on in it. There's, so to speak, a lot of balls in the air being juggled at the same time.
So part of what we want to do is pay very close attention to what exactly is being said of what. And there's a little bit of irony in my saying it like that because what are we doing? We're talking about you know, what is being predicated of, of what subjects in Hegel's own account. We also want to be very conscious of which different approaches are able to accomplish what and what they're not able to accomplish for the, the two deficient approaches here, uh, you know, argumentation or raisonieren and picture thinking or um, forstellung. And we also want to think why it is that they're, they're not able to do that. And in Hegel's view, this actually has to do with what is going on when they are thinking their way through the, these logical categories of subject, predicate, accident, what's also going on behind the scene in terms of the, the thinking, the apprehending, the, the acting subject, the self, the human being who's, who's doing this, for whom all of this stuff is... You might say out there in, in the world, but also there linguistically and in, in thought. Um, you know, if we want to go back, this is sort of a little digression, to Aristotle's metaphysics and categories and everything else in between that's supposed to like lead you from one to the other. Aristotle was, you know, he was one of the first thinkers to systematically grasp and try to work out the implications of the fact that being and thought and language, while not exactly, not exactly coinciding or mirroring each other, are interconnected. And that the clues that are present in one help us to better understand the other. What we do in one of these areas modifies what's going on in another. Hegel is trying to work out this insight and make it much more rigorous. Um, so let's look at what he has to say. So he said he's talking still about um, argumentation. He says, but in view of the fact that such thinking has a content, whether of picture thoughts or abstract thoughts or a mixture of both, argumentation has another side which makes comprehension difficult for it. The remarkable nature of this other side is closely linked with the above mentioned essence of the idea. Rather, it expresses the idea in the way that it appears as the movement which is thinking apprehension. Remember, we were talking earlier in section, uh, some of the sections preceding this, about the idea, and you know, Hegel backtracked that to noose, and then he cast that back forward into the Aristotelian species or kind or determinate universality. So how does racinative, as he's calling it here, argumentative thinking work itself out. He says, um, in its positive cognition, the self is a subject to which the content is related as accident and predicate. So you notice I've got here subject. When we're, when we're looking at a matter, and there's, by the way, there's, there's sort of a play on words or deliberate equivocation, intentional ambiguity going on with this term subject here. Because subject can mean one thing in relation to accidents, another thing in relation to predicates, and another thing when we're talking about agency. Um, all of these are, are wrapped up in this, and Hegel's kind of playing off of these. So, he says, the subject constitutes the basis to which the content is attached and upon which the movement runs back and forth. This is the way we normally think about when we're doing, say, formal logic or, you know, even diagramming sentences, is the way we normally think about um, the relation between subjects and their, their qualities, as we would say. Um, Hegel's not using that term quality here, and we'll, we'll see why in just a, a few minutes. I represented this graphically for a reason. Uh, when we talk about subject, in, in Greek, hupokemenon, uh, or in Latin, subjectum, um, what we're thinking in terms of is some substance, some, some thing, about which then we can say other things. And we can think of it in terms of 
the essence of the thing, the what it is, and then accidents. For example, I, you know, it's used in Aristotelian example, I'm a human being. The fact that I have, you know, we don't, we actually say white skin, but it's not white, it's pinkish, right? Pinkish, yellowish, undertone of blue to it, brown hair, uh, certain height. These are all things you can predicate about me, but they can also be understood as accidents. You could change those, and I could still remain the kind of being that I am, because there's other human beings that don't have my, my skin color, or, or hair color, or height, or age, or position, you know, where, where they are, they're not on video. We can run down all these different accidental properties. And this is one way of, of thinking about things. These are less closely connected to what, it, what the thing is, these are, this is, this is what the thing is, right? Now, another way of thinking about it is in terms of predicates. When we say uh, Greg Sadler is 44 years old, which it currently is true, it wouldn't have been true a month ago, um, we're predicating a, a age, a number of, of me, and we're saying that that's something about what it is that I am. Now, when we already have in mind a given subject and we're just sort of like adding ideas to it, you know. We've already got the outlines, we have already got, you know, the thing in mind, and we're saying, you know, do, you, do I want to be a person who's eating steak tonight or a person who's eating potatoes tonight? Those would be accidents, right, which we could predicate. Nothing important is really going on. Nothing, nothing uh really life-changing, consciousness-changing, anything like that, because we're taking the subject for granted as something that's known. What about when we're trying to figure out, what is that? What is the subject? How does it work? Is it what we think it is? Now we're dealing with something quite different. Because now the predicates really matter a lot. And among the accidents, among the things that we can see about it, we might want to try to distinguish which of them are actually closer to what that thing is. And if we strip away all of the predicates, all, all the accidents, what are we left with? Are we left with human being? Or are we left with a, a sort of nothing, something like an armature just hanging there in logical space. That's the question that Hegel says causes, you know, problems for reasoning, and it just goes back and forth and back and forth. Why? Well, in part because it doesn't realize that it itself is engaged in this process, and it also doesn't realize the importance of the predicates. So what if we're doing speculative thinking, but drive into thinking? What if we're thinking things through their notion? He says, since the notion is the object's own self, which presents itself as the coming to be of the object, it is not a passive subject inertly supporting the accidents. It is, on the contrary, the self-moving notion which takes its determinations back into itself. Now, one way of thinking about this is that the subject is kind of swallowing up all these accidents, all these predicates, all the things that you can say, you know, even the relationships that it has to other things. But another way that Hegel frames it, that he focuses on here, is that the subject itself is sort of self-giving. It is, it is moving out into its predicates, he says. He says, um, the passive subject itself perishes. It enters into the differences and the content. This is what the content is, the, the predicates. So to say, you know, for example, we're doing theology. God is good. Um, God becomes sort of just a, a meaningless name until you can figure out well, what the hell does good mean. And then once you start exploring that, now you actually start to know what that is because this is sort of leached into its own predicates. And there might be multiple predicates at, at work. How can God be just and merciful at the same time? Or we can ask, what is the state? Or what makes things beautiful? 
or what's going on in this particular kind of music. And we begin with a subject, and then we start predicating, and the subject, by a kind of intellectual osmosis or self-donation, becomes its predicates. So he says, the subject that fills its content ceases to go beyond it and cannot have any further predicates or accidental properties. We start to realize the what it is by grasping things in terms of quality. Not in terms of substance or being or subject apart from quality, but we grasp quality as having an ultimate metaphysical priority over any other determination that we would like to think of place, time, uh, agency, passivity, all these other categories, including number, quantity, and including substance, usia, in, in the, the classic uh, Aristotelian text. So he says, the, passive, the, the solid ground which argumentation has in the passive subject is therefore shaken. Only the movement itself becomes the object. So he says, um, the, dispersal of, the dispersion of the content is thereby bound together under the self. It is not the universal which, free from the subject, could belong to several others. The content is, in fact, no longer a predicate of the, substance, the subject, but is the substance. It is the concept. The predicate is where the side of the concept is. The notion. And he says, picture thinking likes to understand things just by looking at all the accidents or, or predicates and it sort of, you know, helps to sketch them in, sort of like color by numbers. Um, it doesn't know what to do with this here. He says, that which has the form of a predicate in a proposition is the substance itself. It suffers, as we might put it, a counter thrust. Starting from the subject as though this were a permanent ground, which, which it's not. That's the thing. What gives the, the subject its permanent ground is the person, the thinker, who is apprehending this. All of this is taking place for and in consciousness. And in this process, consciousness is coming to know what... The thing in its concept or notion truly is in relation to, to itself. So he says, uh, it finds that since the predicate is really the substance, the subject is passed over into the predicate by this very fact has been sublated. So what we have going on here is actually the process of what Hegel calls... We translate that in English as sublation. And that means the development of something through negation into something else, something different, something greater, something that includes and incorporates it. Um, we can think of this in terms of the development of, of shapes of consciousness, of the gestalten through the dialectical process. The, the, the new one that develops incorporates much of what has gone before, at least in outline, uh, but sort of leaves behind the detritus. This also happens at the level of subject-predicate logic, Hegel would say, if we're following the speculative process. So, pleasure is the good. What's going on there? The classic statement of hedonism, right? Should we regard it in terms of pleasure being the subject and it has the quality of being the good? But then perhaps we should actually turn it around. Maybe the good is pleasure. And one, you know, if we follow this out, we're not going to try to do that right now, we could follow this out and look at it dialectically and we would find that not only can pleasure be understood as something good, not only can the good be understood as pleasure, but also all sorts of 
openings to the negative are going to occur in this as well, where we have to say, but wait a second, aren't there good and bad pleasures? The dialectic that, for, for example, gets carried out in uh, Plato's works, or Aristotle's works. In any case, he says, it's been sublated and sensed in this way what seems to be the predicate has become the whole and the independent mass. Thinking cannot roam at will, but is impeded by this weight. So we see that two different kinds of thinking that we've now talked about quite a bit. Raisonieren, uh, you know, argumentative, rationative thinking, which doesn't actually have a foundation for itself, but is sort of a loose, free activity, which unfortunately lapses into vanity as a result and can't handle a dialectical approach to subject, predicate, accident, those sorts of things. On the one hand, on the other hand, picture thinking, Vorstellung, uh, you know, wanting to imagine everything in terms of images, in terms of things that it can wrap its, its head around uh, and its eyes around and its hands around and say things can only really be this way. Both of those are going to be stymied by what, what speculative or dialectical, begreifende, working with the concept, the notion, the begriff, thinking actually does. So Hegel is trying to caution us at this point against lapsing back into those not deficient uh, in all cases, but deficient in this case modes of thought.